Yeah. 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 Which you mean if you Americans you understand that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and this building, this facility, which uh, does a lot of research with regards to soldiers who served in this area, uh, was was opened in uh, 2014, and it would be really interesting to become more involved <coughs> in trying to do more research on the Canadians that were at Passchendaele, and I'm only too pleased to help you at some point in time. This is the actual uh, Memorial Museum building for everybody back in Victoria. Uh, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. And one of the things that I was particularly interested in with your museum and looking at your website is your discussion of, of working with empathy and working with memories. And I think that is so significant. And largely this presentation, Belgium Remembered in British Columbia, is really looking at empathy and memory. We've come a long way. Uh, this is where I live, way over here. This is where we are today. It's 7,843 kilometers between Victoria and Ypres. So a nine hour time difference. Uh, so that's why we're taping this for people for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we're on the west coast of Canada. And this gives you this, this blue border here. Uh, that's the size of our province. Uh, this is where Chris and I live, down here in Victoria. Uh, most people in British Columbia live within, say, 20 minutes of the American border, but certainly many soldiers came up from all these areas. But this gives you a, a great idea of just how large our province is. The United Kingdom fits within our province, and, and you can see, I'm afraid, uh, Belgium right here uh, compared to, to British Columbia. And then, of course, we're just one of 10 provinces, the westernmost province. This will give you an idea of population in British Columbia at the time. Uh, prior to the Great War, there was 392,480 people living within BC. Uh, these population figures are from the Canadian census, and these are the only two available dates that we have for 1911 and 1921, around the wartime, or wartime era. And then you can see for 2018, we have almost 5 million people living in the province. Uh, during the Great War, there were about 7 million people living in Canada. Oops. One of the things that I thought would be really interesting to do working with the Canadian census was to, we can keyword search our census. So I wanted to know how many Belgian people are living in the province but I had to pick keywords. So I picked Belgium, Belgian, Flemish, and Flanders, and this is what came up. Nearly uh, about 1,230 individuals for the 1911 census, and then after the war, just over 2,000 people uh, from your community, your, your nation, uh, living in the province. Within British Columbia itself, there was just over 55,000 men and women that joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Of those, over 43,000 served overseas, over 6,000 lost their lives, and nearly 14,000 were wounded uh, during their service overseas. The British Columbia Battalions served in all four Canadian Infantry Divisions. And just to, to show you, you have the 7th Battalion CEF, which has the number one on it, because it's the first British Columbia Regiment. You have the 16th Battalion, which is the Canadian Scottish. These two units were both part of the 1st Canadian Division. You have the 29th Battalion CEF, known as Tobin's Tigers from Vancouver, who uh, were part of the 2nd Division. The 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifles, which were infantry. They did not have horses, uh, regardless of, of the name. They were part of the 3rd Division. And then within the 4th Canadian Division, you have the 47th, which is from New Westminster, which is on our mainland, the 54th Kootenay, which is in the interior of British Columbia, the 72nd Seaforth Highlanders, which are from Vancouver, and the 102nd Battalion CEF, which were known as the North British Columbians. All units here served uh, within this area, but we, can't, we must remember, too, the support units, the artillery, the Medical Corps, the Canadian Army Service Corps that also served within this area. When I started on this project, uh, it became very interesting to me how often you saw Belgian names in British Columbia. And so the larger the name, 
the more often we saw it. So Passchendaele is probably the one name that we see the most often. The smaller names, uh, not so much. And something like Langemark, which I show here, that name was on a memorial. But subsequently that memorial deteriorated and is no longer uh, available to be seen. But it gives you a really good idea of some of the places that, of Belgium that are commemorated at home. <laughs> because it's really important for people at home to, families wanted to connect with what happened overseas. It was, a, Belgium was a far, far away. And it's been interesting trying to see how families connect with their family members who served and uh, are buried here. One of the things that's on exhibit at the Royal British Columbia Museum, where I work as the associate registrar, is this wooden box carved from wood from St. Martin's Cathedral. This is one of perhaps a half a dozen objects from one soldier from the Canadian Scottish. Uh, this is one of the things that he brought home. We also have his tunic and a few other things. Uh, very popular piece. I've actually spoken on the Battles of Ypres in British Columbia, choosing this uh, souvenir box as a, as, as a single focus item. And it was really interesting to see the reaction from the people towards this one object. Everybody wanted to see it after they had more context. Uh, the, the number one thing that everybody knows in Canada, and you as well, will be in Flanders fields, Flanders poppies. The Flanders poppies in Flanders fields, the poppies grow, poppies blow. The, the children read it, they sing it, people discuss this poem, they debate this poem. It was at one time an anti-war poem during the 1960s, but of course this poem is really about recruitment. And it's certainly come back to that, where people are now taking it the next step. What does this poem mean? And interpreting it in within the context that it should be. But the Flanders poppy was also adopted at home by the Great War Veterans Association, which is returned veterans coming back to Canada. They precede the Canadian Legion, now the Royal Canadian Legion. They were formed in 1917, and they adopted the poppy for fundraising purposes. Certainly they were selling poppies by 1922 in Canada, possibly as early as 1921 but I can't confirm that yet. In a tiny little community in Chilliwack, the poppy was a central focus to the Great War Veterans Association fundraising theme. However, the poppy itself was something that in 1919, we were not encouraging soldiers to bring it back. Do not import this poppy. They were concerned for, we might think today, that it's an invasive species, something from outside of the country, what happens if it brings, we bring it here. But the other concern was the poppy was so well known, if we bring it to Canada and it grows en masse throughout British Columbia, what are we taking away from the war effort? What, we're, 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 we're sort of uh, taking it, we're making it too common in some ways. However, that's all changed. Today, Veterans Affairs Canada freely distributes poppy seeds all across Canada. And so at a number of different events in Canada, you will actually see these uh, being given away. At the time of the Great War, in 1914, there were two Belgian embassies in operation in British Columbia. There was the very fine uh, Terry's Drugstore operating in Victoria, British Columbia. And then this, the Rogers Building, the, the Belgian consul was also in Vancouver. Mr. Terry, though, was very interesting. There is a newspaper called the Times Colonist that's keyword searchable for this time period. And Mr. Terry was very active in keeping track of Victorians who were Belgians and if they were going to serve. And he kept track of them all through the war. And there's something here later of one soldier who Mr. Terry especially tracked. One of the other things that's very common, I don't know if you're aware of it, all across Canada, certainly in British Columbia, was raising money for, for poor little Belgium. It was a common practice. There, was, there were charity tags related to Belgian relief. There were pins. 
a number of different items that were given so that people showed on their lapels that they had contributed to this fund. And this was active all through the war with uh, subscription lists published in our newspapers to say who contributed. And that's also interesting because when you publish a list of names, it also shows who isn't contributing. So there's a bit of, shall we say, competition to encourage others to donate in the future. A very interesting <coughs> organization from all across Canada, certainly very active in British Columbia, was the Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire. They have hundreds of chapters across uh, Canada. And in this tiny little community of Chilliwack, the Saint Eloy chapter, uh, was directly named after the battles, named at about the same time as when the battles were occurring. They ran from 1916 to 1923 and did everything from garden parties to organizing fair exhibits, anything that they could do to promote comforts for soldiers overseas or to provide for, for Belgium in terms of monetary contributions, refugee clothing, and things like that. Probably in Chilliwack alone, there were about 20 different IODE chapters. So the Saint Eloy one is, is one of several. This was really interesting. We're all familiar with Talk H here, which is headquartered and based and originated out of Poppery in Belgium, uh, located to the west of Ypres. Uh, Talk H came to British Columbia. All across Canada, in fact, there were 50 different Talk H chapters. And in British Columbia, there were nine. They took on the mission of what Talk H was originally formed for and did very good work for the local community chest or created Boy Scout troops, anything to keep uh, the memories and uh, the, the mission of Talk H going. And they met here at this uh, St. Thomas Anglican Church uh, in Chilliwack, this particular group. The interesting thing about the Times Colonist newspaper as well is they published a number of letters related directly to Belgian serving soldiers. We have Private Louis Pinson's letter here, which uh, one month and a half more and it will be a year ago since I left your Victoria. And so this Mr. Pinson was, was discussing about his time in Victoria, what he had done, uh, and that he carried a Belgian flag that was given to him to bring over here. And subsequently, he, he says, the flag is a fine souvenir. I sent it to England for safekeeping because when he was in action, uh, he knew there was a chance that it might be lost. It would be very curious to know if that flag has survived. In addition, though, uh, this is something that is not uncommon. Uh, because of the language differences, uh, Flemish speaking, there was concern in English speaking British Columbia, uh, are, are you German? Uh, and so people like Mr. Eekman uh, wrote into the, uh, the Times Colonist newspaper to say, no, I, I'm a native of Brussels, Belgium, late of the 12th Regiment of the Line, which is also interesting because there must have been a connection within Victoria to the 12th Regiment of the Line. At least two of these letters that I'm showing you today are from the 12th Regiment of the Line. So there must be some kind of connection there. And I found it interesting, Mr. Eekman, uh, he says the, the, his name means lion in Belgian. I don't know, is that, is that true? Is, you never know how these are translated or, or used within a newspaper setting. So any of this material that I show you today that you're interested in, you're more than welcome to obtain copies of these or uh, because I suspect we'll keep in touch. I hope we keep in touch. <laughs> Hermann Kaisergruber, uh, he suggested that his English interpretation of his name, and perhaps you can confirm this, was Kaiser's grave digger. Are we even close to that? We're not sure. <laughs> close, I think, maybe. Uh, he speaks Flemish fluently, and he only left for Austin for Victoria in 1913. He had served as an interpreter with the 16th Battalion Canadian Scottish, which is one of the units of the 1st Canadian Division. And uh, he found uh, wearing a kilt very interesting. And uh, he says, when he left here, his knowledge of English was crude, but now his talking is only distinguished by a fascinating Flemish accent wearing a kilt. 
This was uh, the other letter from a private of the 12th Regiment of the Line, Hubert Gustin. I don't know if you have the ability to track any of these soldiers, uh, but he writes to this Miss G.L. King. This was a common practice with organizations back at home writing letters overseas, particularly to soldiers at the CEF. Uh, this uh, young woman was writing uh, back and forth to Mr. Gustin, who wanted to continue writing back and forth and sent a button from his old tunic to her as a souvenir. So these are always good little things to hear about. You always wonder, you know, what, what became of this one little souvenir, and you would hope that it survived perhaps uh, in her possession somewhere, or in the family's not possession now. Uh, within British Columbia, there is at least three Victoria Crosses associated uh, with the war here in Belgium. Um, Mr. Ballou from the uh, 7th Battalion, he was awarded his VC near Kersalar. He was a prisoner of war. Uh, George Randolph Perks of the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles, he was awarded his Victoria Cross here at Passchendaele. He became a Lieutenant Governor of the province of British Columbia. And then at the end, George Henry Mullen of the Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry, whose family is based in Victoria, but he, doesn't, he has this distant connection because he's actually joined up out of province, but uh, many of the letters related to the Mullins family are published within the Times Colonist newspaper. They talk about his father serving and his brother serving, one of whom was killed, and they had joined originally the 88th Battalion, CEF, which was broken up for reinforcements. We also have Roland Burke, who was with the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. He was awarded the Victoria Cross for the second Ostend raid. He had participated in both Ostend raids, uh, the, the, the first one for which he received the Distinguished Service Order, and then the second one uh, where he received the Victoria Cross in command of a motor launch. He had dreadful eyesight, and for many, uh, several times when he tried to enlist, he was turned down, and he was turned down finally made his way to Britain where he was accepted by the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. He re survived, um, came back to uh, British Columbia and served throughout the Second World War. Uh, very fascinating man with the, with the Royal Canadian Navy. One of the things, I don't know if you're familiar with these, we have these uh, hydroelectric boxes that are all over the city of Victoria and they're often vandalized. So one of the things that they came up with was, well, let's cover them with something. Let's cover them with historical information so maybe they won't get vandalized as much. So we have this one for George Perks, uh, which is on, uh, I think this is on Tattersall in Victoria, which is very near to where he lived. And then this one in Esquimalt, where Roland Burke lived. This one showing his awards uh, specifically. Uh, sadly, the opposite side of this, facing the road, has actually been vandalized. But still, it is a very good way to stop these hydroelectric covers from getting covered in paint, and uh, you learn something by reading them. Mary Richard Hamilton was a wonderful, wonderful artist uh, based out of Victoria. She desperately wanted to be a war artist during the time of the war. She finally got her chance after the war from 1919 to 1922. She painted over 300 works in northern France and Flanders and throughout Belgium, working for an organization called the Gold Stripe, which is a tribute to the British Columbia men who were war amputees. So there's about five volumes <coughs> of this particular magazine that has tremendous amounts of information about her work and several other things that your museum could actually be interested in. Of her works, of her 300 works, she eventually donated 227 to the Canadian Archives. So we're very fortunate to have those within a, a public domain for people to access. Perhaps one day you might want to do an exhibit. Uh, this is an example of some of her work. We have Kemmel Road, uh, Flanders, A Walk in the Ruins of Ypres, the Monument at Passchendaele, and uh, the Bunkers at St. Julian. So these are just four. Many of these you can find online, so I would encourage you that if you're interested to investigate a little bit more of Mary Richard Hamilton. She had exhibits in uh, Vancouver, in Victoria, uh, 
uh, London, uh, Amion, and, and Paris. So I've actually seen one original work of hers uh, that is still with the family, and it, 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 they're, they're very, very interesting and very fine paintings. Now, when I spoke to you earlier about the, the place names of Belgium that are in and around British Columbia, I, I mentioned that Langmark was gone. And that is because the Esquimalt Shrine, totally made out of wood, uh, which was uh, erected in 1917, it, it had to be removed in 1927 because it had simply deteriorated. This central portion, however, was saved and is on exhibit at St. Paul's Anglican Church in Esquimalt, it would be an amazing project to, to resurrect something like this because on the base it has a number of Belgian place names which I've, I've chosen to, to show you here, Messines, Kemo, Hill 60, uh, getting specific about the first and second battles of saint uh the second and third battles of, of Ypres. The Japanese Canadian War Memorial from 1920 is located in Vancouver. Uh, on the, uh, this sort of flower petal like base are the names of two of your communities. We have Passchendaele and we have Mons. The story of the Japanese Canadians and the Canadian Expeditionary Force is absolutely fascinating. Uh, they were not accepted for service within British Columbia regiments. Uh, this was due to racism uh, within our province, but many of them joined in Alberta. And in 1920, they erected this monument to say, this is who we are. This was a, a lit torch. Uh, and they've recently added a Japanese Canadian name for Afghanistan on it. So it is still very much a living artifact. A little bit further north in North Vancouver uh, is the uh, North Vancouver War Memorial, which features Eper on the side. And I, I'm always very interested that these place names were very common speak for one entire generation. Every day they would speak of these. Those veterans of the war, those family members could speak of Ypres or Passchendaele. And I wonder now what people think when they're at these memorials and they see these names. Where are these places? What are they about? And as you know, we can find out what they're about. It's just how far do we take our interest and, and perhaps uh, start investigating in Maple Ridge, this is also on uh, near Vancouver, about uh, 40 minutes out, uh, east of Vancouver. There is this Celtic cross with all the names of uh, soldiers from the Maple Ridge community. But down here, this is, it seems to be a popular way of doing things in some parts of British Columbia. There's a stone that's been engraved, Ypres. There's a, about half a dozen different stones. And depending on where the memorial is, because this is about the third different setting I've seen of it, uh, those stones do get moved around at times, but they, they still have them all. In Kelowna, which is uh, more closer to the interior of the province, up in the Okanagan, we have this cairn where one of these markers is marked Sanctuary Wood. I, I did try to go back up to uh, Kelowna this summer to get a better picture of this and to see what the other names are are on it. That, that will come another time and maybe uh, if I've been good, because tomorrow is St. Martin's Day, <laughs> you'll let me come back and I'll show you some other slides sometime. This is in Cloverdale. This is very near to where I live in Vancouver when I'm you know, on the mainland. Uh, very tiny little community, uh, commemorates many of the soldiers as well in Surrey. This is a really interesting one though, because all the soldiers' names, this is the only place I've seen this, includes where they died either in France or where they died in Belgium. <coughs> uh, the memorial was originally placed in 1921 and redeveloped in 2005. Uh, this originally had a German field gun on it, but like many field guns in Canada, they were scrapped at the beginning of the Second World War. So not many of our field guns actually survived and this statue subsequently put on. This will give you an idea of some of the soldiers where they died within Belgium, Mr. Triggs at Passchendaele, Mr. Herford at Passchendaele, Sidney Smith and Eber, Goldstone at Saint Eloy, Wicks at Passchendaele, <coughs> Eber, and George Albert Rowland in Pompering. So you you see when you when you start to do something, 
and at the same time I've been gathering this information, I've also been doing it for other provinces, but BC is pretty close, I, I can do this easy. <laughs> uh, I've done similar things for France, but I really wanted to do Belgium first to, to see what we could come up with. In Richmond, uh, this, uh, another Celtic cross, uh, was erected in 1922 to commemorate their fallen. And all these memorials include Second World War soldiers as well. Uh, and the stone here, again, is marked Eper. Then in Fort Langley, which is, Fort Langley is known as the birthplace of British Columbia, relating to uh, 1858, our gold rush, many other things. It's complicated history. We could do uh, probably a month of lectures on it, but we won't go there. Uh, we have this uh, memorial that includes various sites from uh, alongside here for Eper and Passchendaele, including the soldiers' names at the bottom. This is an interesting memorial because I think they were cataloged purchased. Nearby, in the town of Murrayville, is the exact same monument, same manufacture, but the only difference is they've included Mons on the side of theirs as well. The names are the same. In <coughs> Chilliwack, there's another monument like this for the Independent Order of Odd Fellows that has their soldiers' names on it as well, but I did not check to see if they had any place names on it. All in good time. Now one of the things that Chris and I have done is when we come here, we've cycled around all over. We, we get into, we base ourselves in Eper, we rent our bicycles, and we have an objective for the day. This objective was, let's go to Plugsteer Churchyard for a very specific reason. I think it was 18 kilometers. You just cycle straight there. We can putter all the way back. So we get there in say an hour and a bit, but it takes us about eight hours to get back because we'll go off many different side roads. But this was important because this soldier, Lieutenant Her Herbert Beaumont Boggs of the 7th Canadian Infantry Battalion, he is one of the first officers who was killed uh, during the Great War. And he was killed while in training with British infantry units at the front, him and another soldier. And he's buried here in this churchyard. Because of his loss, his father, Herbert Boggs, became involved in constructing the Victoria War Memorial. And I always like to show this, even though it doesn't include Belgian place names, it has this connection to Belgium through his son. Uh, there were several other people on the Victoria War Memorial Committee. Most of them had lost family. But the soldier figure that is there, uh, the same sculptors, the March family, also made the statues for the Canadian National War Memorial, which is in Ottawa. And incidentally, I'm working over here in one of those buildings. When you walk around our cemeteries, uh, and, and, and this is great fun because I get to speak to you for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. It takes hours to find these when you, you walk a, a giant cemetery like Ross Bay and I found John Franklin Peters and Gerald Hamilton Peters. Uh, the commemoration is for uh, Celebique, I believe, and uh, St. Julian. Uh, both of these lads uh, lost their lives in the First World War. There it is, Celebique and St. Julian. Uh, their brother was awarded the Victoria Cross during the Second World War. He was also a First World War veteran, and he was killed at Oran Harbor in North Africa. Then we have brothers fallen at Ypres as well. others, uh, George Elliott and Lieutenant Fred Fletcher Elliott. Uh, interesting that the dates for the Elliots and for the Peters are exactly the same. 24th of April, 1915, 3rd of June, 1916. And it's been interesting trying to see how families uh, connect with these dates because these dates seem to appear quite often. And then we have Gunner John Wilkinson, also in the Ross Bay Cemetery. His memorial, shown here, records that he was gassed at Passchendaele on November 16th, 1917, and that he died in March of 1919. The interesting thing in, in particular about this memorial is that when you keyword search the Times colonist, his name comes up, and he chose to come back home to die in Victoria. That's how the, the, the column is, is headed. 
Now this fellow, Lieutenant George Walter Nation, also of the 7th Battalion CEF, this is how this project started. Probably indirectly when I was at university in the 19, late 1970s, early 80s, when a university professor said, for extra marks, an essay on memorial architecture would be really interesting, specifically Ross Bay. And when I was walking around, I learned of George Walter Nation. He is also commemorated at Christ Church Cathedral in Victoria. And this is the marker at Ross Bay, where he's recorded as killed in action near Zillabeek. And then we have the stained glass window that's at Christ Church Cathedral in memory of their dear son, George Walter Nation. He's been buried, he's buried at railway dugouts, burial ground, uh, which Chris and I have both visited. We have Armour William Cowan Jeffs of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. This is a flat headstone in the ground, uh, missing in Ypres, Belgium. So it's walking a lot of ground trying to find these, these different things, and uh, it's always interesting when you come across something uh, new to add. Harrington McLennan, again, killed at Ypres, uh, April 22nd, 1915, the, the first gas attack. Uh, his father was a very well-known man in British Columbia. He was the head of McLennan, McFeely and Pryor, which is a well-known hardware and general store firm. And it's just interesting that when you, you walk along these paths and, and suddenly you see things like this, there is that connection of this is what my son did, this is what my family did. And I think that's really interesting to see in, in many different places. I'm sorry for the quality of this photograph. This is a brass plaque that's at that same St. Thomas Anglican Church at uh, uh, Chilliwack. Uh, Edward Beldum, who was killed in action at Passchendaele. These brass plaques uh, are in several churches. Uh, this was the only one I knew specifically for Belgium up until the day I basically left and discovered that a man has recently done a documentary called Countdown to Sanctuary Wood, where he was inspired by a plaque with, found within a, a church in Delta. And I have a photocopy of that plaque if you're interested in seeing it. At the Union Club in Victoria, this is a uh, a, uh, a club for business gentlemen of the, of the community, of the city, which of course is our capital city in British Columbia. It was founded in 1879, and they have the McGregor Lounge, which includes this plaque here to various members of the club who lost their lives. And both their president, Captain James Herrick McGregor, and Secretary Lieutenant Bromley lost their lives during the, the, the Great War very prominent individuals within our community. And of course, the uh, McGregor Lounge is named after their president. Edith Cavell, you'll be very familiar with. Uh, this school in Vancouver was founded in 1908 and renamed in 1920 as Edith Cavell. Uh, Edith Cavell was a nurse who had tended to the wounded from both sides of the fence, from British, Canadians, German, uh, helped, uh, individuals uh, escape and was subsequently arrested and, and executed. Uh, there's also a Mount Cavell. Uh, Chris and I have been talking about this quite a bit this week. Uh, Duncan is a community that we're very familiar with on the Vancouver Island and we have a number of streets. Uh, we have Ypres Street, Cavell Street, San Julian. I, I only just chose Duncan because <coughs> I, I knew it well and to get the pictures easily. I'm sure there are others, because I've only really just started uh, investigating a lot of this thing. And you can see again, more and more poppies being used to commemorate these sites. There is a heritage tree planted in uh, Fort Langley for William Arthur Wilson, who lost his life at Passchendaele. This is actually a replacement tree done relatively recently because the <coughs> original uh, became diseased and needed to be replaced. But it was very interesting to, to, to see this uh, having been resurrected again. And so I managed to get a picture of it too. The various units from British Columbia also include Belgian names on their insignia. The British Columbia Regiment, which perpetuates the 7th Battalion CEF, includes Ypres, Passchendaele, France and Flanders, 
uh, on these scrolls that you see uh, within its cap badge, because these are places that uh, the regiment had served. And these titles will also show on their regimental colors. You'll be familiar with the Canadian Scottish. This is, uh, they perpetuate the 16th Battalion CEF. To some degree, the 16th Battalion CEF is sort of a British Columbia regiment. It's a British Columbia re regiment because the Canadian Scottish perpetuated it. But originally when it was formed, it comprised the 50th Regiment Gordon Highlanders from Victoria, the 72nd Regiment Seaforth Highlanders from Vancouver, the 79th Camerons, and the 91st Argyle and Southern Highlanders from Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, three regiments perpetuate that battle at Kitchener's Wood from April uh, 22nd to 25th. And in the 1930s, the CEO of the Canadian Scottish had this insignia, this brass shoulder title in particular, uh, developed to commemorate that action. Because at Kitchener's Wood, of course, that was a, a, an oak plantation where the uh, French Kitchener's, uh, the kitchen staff, field staff were located. And uh, it was really good to have something that was specific to that site incorporated as an honor. They had wanted it as a battle honor. They did not get it. Two other units also included uh, an acorn uh, uh, insignia within their regiment. That included the Calgary Highlanders, who still retained something, and then a unit, the Winnipeg Light Infantry, which had subsequently been absorbed by the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, which is in Manitoba, further to the east. The Canadian Scottish today uh, commemorate the Battle of St. Julian, Kitchener's Wood, every year. It's uh, a dinner uh, where someone, a veteran, used to tell the story of Kitchener's Wood. It's now some younger soldier who tells the story at, at the dinner. Another site that you can look at is the B B British Columbia Geographical Names site, available on the website. These are all places that I discovered uh, named after sites in Belgium. So you have Mons, saint Eloy, Messines, and Mountain near Valenciennes River. And they all seem to be named at about the same time, just after, or well, here in the case of saint Eloy in 1917. It really depends where the surveyors are working at the time. And it's, it's really interesting developing a list like this because you keep wanting to find, well, what else can I put into this search? How are we doing for time? Are we okay? Yeah. Lovely. Then I, I just kept going. We found Langemark, San Julian, Zillabeek, Zonabeek, and Hill 60 Ridge, which, although it does show that it was adopted in 1978, that name was in common use since the end of the Great War, but not officially adopted until 1978. So when you go to the BC Geographical Place Name site, it will actually say things like, in common use, adopted 1978. Now we get on to our adventures. One of the things that I really wanted to do, and, and Chris, <laughs> right, we, we tried to get to Hill 60 for probably six months. I think I saw uh, Karen, I saw you in August. I had been trying in June to get up here, but this is on a forest road area. We had tremendous wildfires, tremendous dryness throughout the province this summer. We couldn't get into this area. And I must have sent Chris, I don't know, 15, 20 different emails I'm available on this weekend. Can we get there? What's happening? Is the road open? Finally, we got there. And uh, this is the, that's the sign, Hill 60, named after Hill 60 in Belgium because of two miners. Thomas Horatio Service, for which I have no photograph of him, originally in the 88th Battalion CEF, subsequently in the Canadian Engineers, and the man who built the tramway, at Hill 60, Angus Ward Davis. Davis was Horatio Service's commanding officer with the 3rd Canadian Tunneling Company. So they were actively tunneling at Hill 60 in Belgium. And when uh, Mr. Service came back to British Columbia, uh, after all his injuries, he, he, he was uh, returned to Canada. He, he was a miner, a prospector. He discovered manganese at this site. And this uh, manganese is used as a hardener for steel. 
it's important in munitions work as well. And so they, they, were, they were working towards developing this mine. Of course, then the Great War came to a close, and subsequently the mine was, was no longer being used. But it was great fun getting to Hill 60. This is not a straight road. Uh, that's the road we used. Uh, this actually looks kinder than it is. <laughs> uh, it's pretty rough. It's actually pretty narrow. Uh, it's pretty bumpy. There were four of us in the pickup truck that was heavily dented and abused already. So uh, there's no way my wife would ever let me take my truck up there. I know that for sure. And this is Jack rebuilding the road in some spots, trying to get us in. So we're uh, throwing rock in there and anything else that we could find because if we get stuck in there, we are at Hill 60 for a very long time. And you needed to go with somebody who had been there because the website, although it encourages you to build, visit Hill 60, it does say you could easily get lost. And when we were driving up there, the number of side, well, roads would not be an appropriate name. Tracks, trails, it was, there's, there's no way. If I tried to walk in there, you wouldn't have a presentation. And then once we got there, Chris pointed to the opening of the mine. Uh, we've got a, a chunk of the mine in his hand here. And so I took the picture and I will admit, so I was like, okay, we've come a long way for a lot of greenery at the mine entrance. But fortunately we decided, well, let's look around a little bit more. And so I got exactly what I wanted, a big hole in the rock cliff, but that's our Hill 60, which commemorates your Hill 60 uh, in British Columbia. I work with somebody in the BC archives named Ember Lundgren, who was so excited I was coming here to, to do this project because her family is from Belgium. Her great-grandmother was a Belgian war bride, which First World War war brides have not been studied like Second World War. And so she was pretty excited. Uh, her great-grandmother Flora Hernaldstein, and I'm sorry, the pronunciation is off, met this fine man, John Burke, who may have been billeted at the Hernaldstein home. Uh, they had a whirlwind romance and were married after three months. Once in England, they had to get remarried all over again for whatever reason, and then they came to Canada. And this is one of the documents that uh, Ember has, and of course, the, the picture of her great-grandparents. He served with the 47th Battalion from New Westminster and was a very well-known ventriloquist. When you were coming to Canada, everybody believes that we're all snow and ice. <laughs> the weather outside today, which is nice and rainy, that is typical BC weather at this time of the year. But the clothing for the climate, she is not always, as many think, our Lady of the Snows. So that's what people are thinking of Canada. But they give us uh, uh, different things that you may want to bring. Warm stockings and gloves, galoshes, a sweater, outside coat, just really good, valuable advice. What is interesting, and most people get astonished by, is when they travel across Canada. This is the train that she traveled on. She took a picture of it. And you can see here on the list, how long does it take to get across Canada? And I just highlighted uh, from Halifax to Vancouver, five days and 13 hours. Halifax to Victoria, five days, 18 hours. So an extra five hours to cross the, uh, what is now known as the Salish Sea. Uh, we do that in a ferry, usually in an hour and 35 minutes now. Once here, they brought Flora's mother out. She emigrated to Canada. But there is a bit of mystery within this family because she actually went by the name of Franck. Somehow the surnames become interchangeable. And Ember is very curious if you know of anybody who could do research to help solve this mystery. And apparently Victorine is a well-known opera singer of the time. Isn't it because the women don't take the name of the men? I, this is something that I don't know. Yeah, we keep our maiden name. We yeah. don't take over the, the, the name of our husbands. Lovely. 
I can't wait for you to tell her that. <laughs> Amber, we have an answer. <laughs> and then here is something else that she was very curious about. This is a personal auspice uh, issued uh, by the, the occupying forces in 1915 uh, to Victorine Franck. And uh, she was quite curious about the, the symbol of what appears to be a, a Jewish star of David. And she does not know if that means that she's Jewish or if it's some kind of other symbol uh, that's, that's commonplace here. Uh, so if anybody can help, uh, that would be absolutely tremendous. And Ember might buy me a cup of tea. <laughs> now this is one that was very personal to me uh, when I came out in August, uh, was Mrs. Kate Palmer's walk. Excuse me for half a second. I discovered this while doing research uh, for this presentation. This was pure happenstance. I was reading through the Times columnist newspaper and discovered this lady and her family, the Palmer family. She was the wife of this man here, Thomas Palmer, who was the deputy police chief in Victoria. And this is her family, which sadly, Roy Palmer did not come home from the Great War. He was killed and is buried at Wood Cemetery to the south of Ypres. And Rosemary and I, we walked down to Wood Cemetery because what I found in the newspaper was a series of notices talking about coming to Ypres to see the grave and how she was so happy to see it was well cared for by the Belgians. But there is a huge difference from before she came here to once she got here because she always spoke about Roy to some degree as, as my son, my son. Then she saw that he was buried with five other comrades from his regiment, all killed about the same day. And then her notices change about the others. It's very emotional when you read it. it it's really captivating to see what, what she went through. And it's right there in the newspaper, if you follow the trail. And when I got there, I had misplaced my paper for Roy Palmer. And I, I where, where, because I, I couldn't remember his first name. And, and there was two Palmers in the register. I said, oh my gosh. So I employed my data device on myself. <laughs> we, we rediscovered him. So I have a whole series of photographs taken at Wood Cemetery showing me uh, what I had found on the, that site. And this is Wood Cemetery here. Uh, this would have been her walk. I, it doesn't discuss how she got here, if she took a cab, if she took a a horse and carriage? Did she walk? I don't know. Was she staying nearby? Did she actually walk through the forest to get to this? Because what we, Rosemary and I, we walked through the woods. We didn't know we could just walk down the road a little further and it was right there. Uh, pardon me. Which, of course, this is from the roadside looking at Wood Cemetery. And I found that really, really interesting. Because uh, from here, I think, if you look out over the fields, you can see uh, the Claw Fall Tower and uh, St. Martin's which is something Chris and I are always aware of when we're traveling about, when we're bicycling, trying to keep these things on the skyline so that we know where we are. Uh, generally, we do okay. <laughs> and then this is his grave here on the uh, right-hand side, Roy Palmer, 8th Battalion Canadian Infantry, which is actually a Winnipeg unit. So I haven't really gone into how he wound up there. He was probably transferred there as a reinforcement. And then something that became very, very personal to me, and this goes back to your museum. This goes back to empathy and to memory and uh, what was it like? So I, I wrote something some time ago and published it uh, about the highway to one man of Passchendaele. So this is Rosemary and I in my car driving up island and it's a, a lovely, lovely highway. We've got the water on the right hand side. And then you turn to the left to get onto the road that leads to Lake, uh, to uh, Couchin Station, to this solitary church. And this is all very poetical. We've got this railway bridge. We've got a river nearby. And the church where Captain Oswald Howie Lunham is buried. And his inscription on his memorial is long suffering, patiently born, because he was uh, gassed at Passchendaele and suffered a complete and total breakdown this day, 10th of November, 1917. So in summation for today, I'll just read this as our conclusion. The highway takes us up the island to our turn to the left. 
to a solitary church near to a railway bridge, near to a river. As we meander toward the church, I contemplate the inscription we are to encounter. One line to remind us, for all time, of one soldier's Passchendaele. Captain Oswald Howie Lunham joined the 112th Battalion CEF and served in France and Flanders with the 13th Canadian Machine Gun Company. Lunham suffered shell shock at Passchendaele this day, 10th of November, 1917. A complete nervous breakdown. Rheumatic fever, difficulty in sleeping, difficulty in the company of others, afraid to be left alone in the dark, headaches and depression. His medical records record, he has the appearance of a very neurotic person and has a cast down expression as if some great sorrow was on his mind. He states he was always of nervous temperament, but since the shell shock, his nervous system seems completely shattered. Lunham's Passchendaele remained with him for the rest of his days, and yet I take some comfort from the words of 1918 when I read from another medical report. He can travel by transport as his wife can accompany him, and it is perhaps from Myrtle Lunham, his dear wife, who chose our thought for now and all time, called to rest after long suffering patiently more. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yes. I spoke before your, 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 your expose about a small Canadian monument here near Ypres. Yes. Between Saint Julien and uh, Saint Julien and Saint Jean. It's you have shown it in your. Uh, in oh, your good. Comments, yes. From um, uh, the, the family Bentain. Oh yes, it was this. That's uh, the Kitchener's Wood one. Kitchener Wood, yeah. Yes. yes. That okay, was, good. That's from the small over here, some kilometers. Oh, thank you. That's good. That's good. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, you've shown us many monuments and with the the names of Belgian places, but some monuments have certain uh, places and other monuments have other. Is it, does it have anything to do with the men coming from those towns? Uh, dying or battling over here or no it, it seems that it, every community has a different way of putting their war memorial together and i suspect what is chosen is possibly by the organizers of constructing mm -hmm. uh, the memorial now when you see things like at the japanese canadian war memorial and you see mons and passchendaele all those petals of the flower mm -hmm. have another town on them so it would be really interesting to read through some kind of War Memorial Committee records to find out how they're choosing these names. But these records don't always survive or they're not publicly held. So for a community like Chilliwack, where I, I was working for a number of years, I know that the records from the Canadian Legion, who were instrumental in putting Chilliwack's War Memorial together, were destroyed in the fire. Mm -hmm. However, their newspaper provides considerable detail as to how they chose the names for the memorial, but Chilliwack does not record towns on it. So it's always, we always keep searching, hoping that we can find a way. I really like that question, actually. It would be really interesting to, to find out. Certainly the Cloverdale Memorial is specific to the individual who lost their life, where it says Ypres or Passchendaele, uh, but, and that's unique so far. Yes. Uh, yeah, you've shown us, of course, a great bunch of um, names who are still in the memory of British Columbia. But um, do you think is that it's because the testimonies of the testimonials, the veterans of the First World War, all passed away now? Is are the names still? Are they still knowing what Passionel means? I mean, is the history of Passchendaele and the history of Canadians in the First World War still well known in British Columbia? I would say, I mean, certainly over the last decade, uh, attendance at our, our memorial services ha have grown hugely. One of the things that I do point out at home is we have the impression that here you remember every day. Back at home, it does seem to happen once a year. Mm -hmm. And the BC Archaeology Society had me speak about three months ago, and I was really grateful because it wasn't November. Uh, and that was, it was really good to, to try and say that 
you know, this is, it's important for us to discuss this throughout the year. Now, specifically to your question, do they know about Passchendaele? I would say yes, they know about Passchendaele, largely because of Paul Gross's movie, Passchendaele, if you're familiar with that. Now, my understanding uh, of Mr. Gross's ideas were to develop a whole series of films, which didn't happen. Uh, we, have, uh, we have his film, and we have this new one, came out last year, Countdown to Sanctuary Wood. I think <coughs> I found it really interesting in coming up with this topic, and somebody said, well, what's the title going to be? And I said, well, Belgium remembered in British Columbia. I might change it later. But that seems to have resonated at home because I wound up with a, uh, a couple of interviews about it, and uh, people were asking me questions. What's it about? What's it about? And I came and I saw Karen, and I said, you know, can we take this? And Karen said, I'll talk to our IT fellow, which is this wonderful person here in the ward who's made it all work. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Happy St. Martin's Day. <laughs> Be good. And uh, it, was, it was really good that all of this came together because now this is going to be played back at home tomorrow on November the 11th. And I hope that uh, and maybe doing little things, I've always said it always starts with one individual. And if you get to present this, this is the first time I've done this, this topic. There'll probably be a second, there'll probably be a third. I suspect I will get to do this at home soon and it will build. That's the goal, mm -hmm. is to try and... It, I was also curious about how Belgians would react to knowing that Belgium is remembered in, in Canada, in, in British Columbia, and how it's remembered. Because when you walk across these things, it, I don't know how common it is for somebody to say, well, I wonder, I wonder where Ypres is. But when I first saw Zillaby all those years ago, it, it, it struck a note with me to say, well, something could be done here. It just took 20 years or 30. We won't go through the top. <laughs> yes. Is it like like a topic in, in the school history in history books? Not so much. The biggest thing that happens, uh, I and I mostly speak from the elementary level because my wife is a school teacher. Is they go through Flanders Fields. They have their own commemorative service. But her school is very well aware right now that uh, I'm in Belgium doing this presentation, and they're all very curious. And this is. Uh, do you have grades here? You know, uh, grade one through grade five. So that's uh, about seven to 12, 11 years old. And so they're very curious when I get back, they're going to ask me all these questions. I'll have to show them pictures. And maybe one of them, maybe two, might come here one day. You never know. Mm -hmm. Like in the UK, I think it's it's compulsory for the school children to, to visit in family space. But it's of the distance, of course. It's that's one thing that does happen at home. Certainly, there's been more and more school groups brought over from Canada. You will certainly see them at Vimy Ridge, and you will certainly see them at the Menin Gate. Mm -hmm. So I think people, it's building awareness. And again, I go back to your vision statement about empathy and about uh, memories. Uh, sometimes when you talk about military history, it's all about capturing the next trench and, and the support, and there's a place for that. But what also connects is a direct connection from one member of the family to the next member of the family. And so the way you portray this history here, I think, is, is absolutely exceptional. It's first grade. You're a great museum. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. One of the ambassadors, Belgian ambassadors, uh, tracked the Belgians who went over here to fight during the First World War. Do you have, or, or you said that he kept an eye open for it? Oh, is, right. Is that, there a list? No, there's, list there's no list that we know of, but the next thing to do is to, because I, I ran out of time too, for mm -hmm. trying to come up with key words to put into the Times columnist, is to start working on Mr. Terry specifically to see who he was keeping track mm -hmm. of. Did his records as Belgian consul survive? And one thing I would mention is uh, Ro uh, Roland Burke, who was awarded the Victoria Cross at Ostend. His uh, burial at Royal Oak uh, in Victoria recently got a new headstone with the Victoria Cross on it, and the Belgian ambassador attended that ceremony. So it's great to see that connection, and uh, perhaps we can uh, 
uh, do more with that uh, for the future. It would make a wonderful research topic and to connect both mm -hmm. Belgium to Canada with Belgians who immigrate there and then mm -hmm. come back and the whole history. I was trying to think of other terms in the census too to search for uh, to see if there was more. I didn't know if there was maybe something I was missing. So that, that list grew, because I can't remember. I, I think one of the last ones I chose was, was Flanders. Well, what happened if I put Flanders in here? Because I thought Belgian, Belgian. Yeah, Flanders and Flemish, which is strange. It, it, but that's how they were reported. So I was just trying to think of all these things, because I mean, I'm, I'm not Belgian at all. So it just kind of think of. What, what words could I use? So if you have suggestions for other things that I might be able to look for, <coughs> I, I, I will certainly try to do that and see what we can come up with. And I, I'm only too willing to provide your museum and archives with, with information. So would you have an, an idea of the numbers of uh, Belgians living in Canada coming back to fight to serve? To die here? There is actually a way to do that. I, I didn't do that this time. Uh, interestingly, the attestation papers for the CEF are available online. Mm -hmm. They are keyword searchable on Ancestry. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do that. Even though the entire files are available from Library and Archives Canada, you have to plow through the files. Whereas I have another interest in my own family who are, of, are from Norway. I, I was keyword searching ancestry for Norway or other words that might show up. And I, I've been assembling that list for three years now. So it would be possible to do Belgium quite easily. So that might be something else we, we, we could do and set it on an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so how come is your interest specifically in Belgium? What, what interested you in, in Belgium? I think... Uh, my wife, Rosemary, said a very interesting thing this August. I've been speaking on this subject for 40 years, and she's known me for 30-something years, and she said, you're at peace here. Mm -hmm. And I've always said that when I travel here, I look for the peace and the chaos. I stand out in those fields, and I, I will imagine what happened here. And I see the regeneration, and I see the regrowth, but I also see the scars of war. And when I write, I try to put what I feel into that history. I try to make something, uh, I write military history very differently because my audience is to people who think visually or who are very connected, perhaps emotionally and deeply. And uh, it's been very interesting to see the responses I, I've got. I think the other connection to Belgium, uh, apart of from being relaxed here and very comfortable here, I think Chris would agree, there, there's just something about cycling around here. We've walked this ground, we've cycled this ground, we've driven this ground, we've visited your museums. The display design here, I just love. I, I just keep wondering, oh my gosh, geez, I wish I could incorporate that in something I did back at home. It, it, there's something different. And I like that. And when I go, I go back to your vision statement about empathy and about memory, and I think that's a huge part of it. Because military history at home isn't always displayed that way. It's the machine gun. It's this. Exactly. It's that. Mm -hmm. But it can also be a ball of wool mm -hmm. for knitting socks for soldiers who are suffering from trench foot and they need dry, dry material to wear. And I think you know, when I first hit the In Flanders Fields Museum, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, look at this. this they're touching on topics that uh, I could only hope would happen back at home. And then we came here to your museum, and then the same thing occurred. And uh, you have something to be very proud of. And I'm very, very pleased that I get to come here and take a look. Thank you. You're inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And on three.